Here in lecture 36C, we're finally at the point where we're going to really combine our differential equations knowledge and our linear algebra knowledge to talk about both the heat equation and solutions. We're going to solve the heat equation on a finite thin rod using something called separation of variables, which is not the exact same kind of separation of variables back from the beginning of the course, but has a somewhat similar feel. And also using Fourier series, as we've been talking about Fourier polynomials in terms of inner products recently. Okay, so now we're putting this stuff together. We're going to consider a relatively simple example, a relatively simple model. We need to make some assumptions to keep things simple. We're given a thin rod of length capital L. Now, I could have picked a specific number for capital L, but I decided to leave it as unspecified. And its axis is chosen so that the left end point is at x equals 0 and the right end point is at x equals L. If it's got length L, you definitely can do that. So I'm imagining essentially the x-axis from 0 to L as being a rod, a thin rod of metal or something that's got a certain temperature distribution, linear. Of course, it can't just be one atom thick. This is a mathematical idealization. We pretend it is. We got our function that we want to solve for. U of t comma x, a function of two variables. It's going to represent the temperature of the bar at time t and at location x. If t and x are fixed, that is one number. That is the temperature in whatever units you happen to be using. But it changes. Over time, for example, as t changes, it also changes in x. We're going to have an initial temperature distribution when t is 0. Boundary conditions. Suppose, for simplicity, we could consider other examples that are not so simple, that the endpoints are kept at a constant temperature of 0. Kept at a constant temperature for all t, no matter what t is. We are somehow setting it up so that the ends of the bar have a constant temperature. They're maybe touching something that's kept at a constant temperature. I don't know exactly how you deal with that in terms of insulation and stuff like that. Don't worry about the actual real life details we are mathematically modeling here. Of course, you, you do need to think about real life ultimately. But we're just trying to think about solutions of the heat equation. So assume u of t is 0 and u of t l is 0 for any non-negative t for all t greater than or equal to 0, is what that means. And yes, we have initial conditions. We have an initial temperature distribution at time 0. We're assuming the function little f of x, which is going to be the function we approximate with a Fourier polynomial and, in fact, get an exact representation of for a Fourier series, is the initial temperature distribution. And, in fact, the example we're going to do is going to be an upside-down quadratic this graph, this function of x, is going to be my initial temperature distribution. I'm assuming when t is 0, this is that function of x for all x in this interval from 0 to l. Here's the fishiest step. Why can we do this? Assumed form of solution is that u of tx is a product capital X of X times capital T of T, a product of a function of X alone with a function of T alone. How in the world is such an assumption justified? The answer is because it ends up working. That's why. When you're problem solving, sometimes you just have to try things and hope that they work. And once in a while, your hope might be fulfilled and they do work. That's it's justified because of the end result. The ends justifies the means. That does not always, that's not something to always live by. But in this case, nobody's getting hurt. We can do it. If we make this assumption, then the partial derivatives are easy to calculate. The partial of this function with respect to little t, capital X of x, weird notation, is constant with respect to t. The partial of u with respect to t is going to be capital X of x times capital T prime of little t. This is like a constant with respect to t. That's intuitively why we were hoping something like this would work to begin with. And a similar kind of thing is going to happen with the second derivative with respect to x, which we need with uh, the heat equation, as we've seen. 
Second derivative of u with respect to x twice is x double prime times t of t. Hmm. Okay. Assuming these things are solutions, go ahead and plug them into the heat equation and see what you can conclude. The logic here is we're assuming we've got solutions that look like this and we're wondering what would they be. That does not actually prove they are solutions. It just tells you possible solutions. You'd have to verify that they truly are in the end. Now we substitute and separate variables. Substitute into the heat equation is what I mean. There's the heat equation where K is an arbitrary positive parameter related to the diffus diffusivity, I can hardly say the word, of the medium, of the bar of metal, like what kind of metal is it? Plug in those derivatives from the previous slide. There's du dt. There's the second derivative of u with respect to typo x twice. That should be a partial x squared. First typo I've caught in these lectures, maybe there have been others. Lectures 36a, 36b, and 36c. Okay, what do we do with this? Well, you could play with it a little bit. You could, for example, divide both sides by capital T of little t and divide both sides by capital X of little x. And if you do, does anything interesting happen? Doesn't seem like it's much until you think about it carefully enough. Hey, that's a function of little t, that's a function of little x. I'm saying when you multiply this one by k, you always get equality? How in the world could that happen? If they're both constant, then it happens. I'm going to give that constant a name. It's a weird name, negative lambda squared. What? Why negative lambda squared? Well, first of all, why negative? The negative sign is based on experience. By putting a negative sign, and in fact doing a square so that this is a negative quantity, or at least not positive, Lambda is not imaginary here. Um, it's going to work. It's going to help it work if we make that assumption. These are all justified assumptions because they end up working in the end. If we did a positive lambda squared, then it doesn't work so nice. What are the resulting ODEs? Ordinary differential equations. We use ordinary differential equations for partial differential equations. Set this equal to negative lambda squared and set this whole thing equal to negative lambda squared. We got two ordinary differential equations then. In terms of x, x double prime plus lambda squared over k times x equals zero. Right? Focus on the blue here. Multiply both sides by capital X of x. Divide both sides by k. Rearrange, you get this. Huh, that looks like a second order harmonic oscillator, un undamped, I guess. Hmm. Its solutions are going to involve cosines and sines. That's where the Fourier series are going to come from. And the other one's a first order equation. Capital T prime is negative lambda squared capital T, which I could also add lambda squared T to both sides. But writing in this form, I know the solution is going to be exponential decay. This is the first kind of differential equations we considered back in the first couple lectures. Yeah, the general solution of this the red equation here, a second order ODE, is a linear combination of cosine and sine of this form. Notice this is a function of little x, not t, where alpha is square root of k here. I could have written a square root of k in both spots, but I just it's nicer to write in alpha. Alpha squared would be equal to k, therefore, as well. Check it. Go ahead and check it. You've seen this kind of thing before. Differentiate. Use the chain rule. Each time you'll get an extra factor of lambda over alpha. But, hmm, will any function like this help me satisfy the initial conditions, the boundary values, actually? At x equals 0 and x equals L, we want x of 0 to be 0 for all t in the u of tx. Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. a times 1 is a. The only way this works is if a is 0. 
And that means it's going to be simpler. We're not going to have any cosine terms in our Fourier series, just sine terms. That's, that's nice. It's working for this particular setup, this particular example. And x of l equaling 0, since a is 0, this term goes away. We can just focus on that term. Plug in x equals l. That means 0 must be b sine of lambda l over alpha. Now, that'll work if b is 0. But hey, if b is 0, then we've done nothing. It's not very helpful. So assume b is not 0. Solve for l. I guess this input to the sine function to make this equal to 0 must be a multiple of n, an integer multiple of pi, n times pi for some n. Some integer n, yeah. Lambda l over alpha must be n pi for some integer n. This motivates us to choose the lambdas to be, solve this for lambda, n pi alpha over l. And that would be true for any n, so maybe I should call these lambda n's. Why am I using lambda? Is this, are these eigenvalues? They actually kind of are like eigenvalues. Not in the exact same way we talked about before, so that's why I'm using lambda. Lambda is, well, we can take it to be positive, so n would be positive here. L and alpha are definitely positive. Of course, pi is positive. And let's write capital X sub n of little x is this, where I've replaced lambda with this right here. And that means the alphas cancel. You don't see any more alphas. You simplify. And the L, uh, yeah, OK. Just double checking things. Yeah, that looks right. It doesn't. They make a mistake here. Solve this for lambda. Get the, plug it in there for lambda. Did I forget to cancel an L? Oh, why do I get the L at the bottom there? I'm a little confused here. Um, oh, I'm not plugging in. I was thinking I was plugging in there. I'm plugging in here for lambda. The alphas still do cancel, but yeah, I'm left with n pi over l. Plugging in right there. And evidently, this is going to work for any positive integer n. So I might as well call these capital X of n. Maybe I've got lots of solutions. What about the first order equation? Its solution is going to be exponential decay, where the coefficient of t is negative lambda squared. And if you square that, remember what lambda sub n was. It was alpha n pi over l, using the previous slide. That's going to become alpha squared n squared pi squared over l squared. And we can write capital T sub n of t equal to this. I've replaced the lambda squared with that thing. Cn is just an arbitrary constant. But now, and what I'm about to show you, I'm going to ignore the arbitrary constants. The CN here and the capital BN from the previous slide, the capital A was 0. I'm just going to multiply without worrying about those constants. Evidently, this is a solution for any positive integer n, where alpha squared is k, and k is the original diffusivity constant in the p equation. Hey, we saw solutions like this before in lecture 35C. Functions like that solved it. It does. And note when t is 0, e to the 0 is 1, you get sine n pi x over l, and that's going to lead to the Fourier series expansion when t is 0. Since the heat equation is linear, which we talked about before as well, sums of solutions are solutions. And as we've seen with Fourier polynomials, higher and higher order sums, higher and higher degree Taylor polynomials approximate functions better and better. This motivates us to hope that the following infinite sum might be the kind of solution we need. Essentially take these UNs and form an infinite linear combination of them, where the BNs are to be determined, the little BNs here. Hmm. Is that OK to do? Can you do infinite linear combinations? Well, if it converges, you can, but you need to understand the details of the convergence, which we won't have time for. And here, I just replace un tx with this expression. When t equals 0, again, e to the 0 is, 
is one, and therefore we hope that this thing with this gone away to equal one, we get this, we hope we can make it equal the initial data, the initial temperature distribution at t equals zero, which we've labeled a little f of x. Can we? The Bn's, this is like an orthogonal projection of f. Now, technically speaking, we've only done orthogonal projections with finite sums. The b's in that case were ratios of inner products with respect to an orthogonal basis of a certain subspace of the inner product space of c, in this case, I guess, 0 to l. Does that work with infinite sums? You can verify that it does. How do we choose the little bn? Use an appropriate inner product space. In this case, let v be the space of all continuous real value functions that are continuous over the entire interval from 0 to L, with inner product defined by this integral. For any finite n, the Fourier, Fourier polynomial we will use will be the projection of the function little f, which I, it's going to be an upside down parabola I mentioned earlier, onto a, a finite dimensional subspace of V. You could label it Wn as the span of these things where these sine functions form an orthogonal basis for Wn. So previously when I talked about this kind of stuff, I was talking about also including the cosine terms and a constant term. So this is different. I don't need the cosines because I, otherwise my boundary, my boundary conditions, 0 at x equals 0 and 0 at x equals L, mean that I want sines instead of cosines. That's problem solving again. This is good enough. Here is the formula for the Bn in terms of an inner product, as we've seen before. And if you simplify this, you get this expression, 2 over L times this integral. The integral itself is the numerator of the fraction. And the 2 over L is really 1 over L over 2. I'll leave it as an exercise to verify that that inner product equals L over 2. You need a trigonometric identity to verify that. And since you're dividing by it, you can write it as 2 over L times the integral. And there's your formula for the Bn's in this case. Okay. If L were equal to pi, it makes it a little nicer. You'd have 2 over pi. You'd have a pi there, and the pi's would cancel. Be a little bit nicer, but in general, we allow for an arbitrary positive L. Getting close to the end here. Hang on. For example, now we look at our example function, our initial heat distribution. Let f of x equal x times l minus x, which is lx minus x squared. That's a function whose graph is an upside down parabola with intercepts at 0 and l, and maximum at l over 2. Yeah, note it satisfied the boundary conditions. f of 0 equals f of l equals 0. That's what our setup was. That was over the kind of PDE heat equation that we were solving. That kind of setup. There's other kinds of setups you can try to solve as well, but this is a simple example. Simpler than some other examples. Using technology or a table of integrals, Bn, um, for this function is what we want to compute. This is not equal to Bn. The Lx here comes from the Lx here. So I'm essentially trying to integrate 2 over L times, times the integral of Lx times sine of n pi x over L. I will also have to subtract 2 over L times the integral of x squared times sine of n pi x over L. Yeah, use uh, either integration by technology, table integrals, or integration by parts if you don't mind doing it, to get this for your antiderivative, you can check that by differentiation. You need to evaluate that from 0 to L. The only term that gives you something non-zero is um, this term when x equals L. When x equals 0, all, both terms are 0 because of the x there. This term when x equals L. The L's cancel there, you get cosine n pi. You get 2L squared over n pi there. You get a negative, you got a negative sign there still. When n is even, 
cos n pi will be 1, so the negative sign from here carries over. When n is odd, cos n n pi will be negative 1. The negative signs cancel, giving you positive 2L squared over n pi. What about the other integral? It's nasty. For x squared times sine of n pi x over L, I use mathematics to help me here. I didn't, I didn't want to do integration by parts to get this an antiderivative. And then it was still tricky after that point. Um, let's see. When x is 0 or L, this term definitely goes away. Your only possible non-zero terms come from this one. When x is L, the L's cancel there, you get cos n pi. You also have this thing when L's get an L squared there. Essentially, this part here and this part here come from plugging in x equals L here when n is even or odd. And when you plug in x equals 0, this part goes away. You get 4L squared over n cubed pi cubed. And you again need to think about, oh, well, when x is 0, you get cosine of 0, which is 1 here. Uh, but you're subtracting what you get when you plug in 0, so you get the negative signs in both spots. This one simplifies nicely. Um, why? Because n is even here. Oh, no, it's, it's well, these cancel. Okay, yeah, that simplifies nicely. Whereas in this one, the 4L squares do not cancel. So it's more complicated when n is odd. However, to get bn, we have to take essentially this expression minus this expression because of the minus sign there. And it actually simplifies pretty nicely. When n is even, it actually simplifies to 0. Essentially, this minus this is 0. When n is odd, it's this minus that. And that simplifies, unbelievably, you might say, pretty nicely to just this. Double check that. So that's what bn is. It's 0 when n is even, and it's this when n is odd. So our sine terms are only going to involve odd values of n. Our proposed solution, if you let n go from 1 to infinity and write bn each time, you would write it this way. If you want to let n go to from 1 to infinity and not write a bn, you have to make adjustments because you would need to use the fact that the bn was 0 when n is even and, and something else when n is odd. You need expressions that are going to be um, odd in this summation. When n is 1, 2n minus 1 is 1. When n is 2, 2n minus 1 is 3. When n is 3, 2n minus 1 is 5. When n is 4, 2n minus 1 is 7. So you need to make that adjustment if you want to actually see the expression in there and let n go from 1 to infinity. It's tricky. If you expand this out without summation signs, it looks like this. Notice n is 1 here, then 3 here, that's 3 squared. Then 5 here, that's 5 squared. There's still plenty of mathematical issues to be resolved, however. Reclaim this is the answer. And it might be unsatisfying that the answer is an infinite series. But it's what we have to live with. Still plenty of mathematical issues to be resolved. For one thing, does this infinite Fourier series converge? And what does that even mean to converge for all x in the interval? There are two notions of convergence going on here. One is called pointwise convergence. And another one is called convergence in norm where the norm is defined as the square root of the inner product of the function with itself, those two notions of convergence aren't the same, but maybe they are equivalent here. And if it converges, is it truly a solution? We haven't, we haven't checked that. You'd have to know if, you can, if it's sufficiently differentiable, once differentiable with respect to t, and twice differentiable with respect to x. You might hope, can you differentiate it term by term? and get new infinite series for those partial derivatives. Do the series that result after you differentiate term by term truly converge and to the appropriate derivatives, in fact? In this example, it turns out everything works out fine, but that is not always the case. There are cases where it does not work out fine. Things go wrong. 
And in fact, the fact that things go wrong sometimes, which was discovered by Fourier, when he, especially when he shared his work with others, caused a crisis in mathematics. At the heart of calculus in the early 1800s, there was a crisis. You can look this up. Precipitated by Fourier. The crisis had to be fixed to know that calculus still works in the way you want it to work. The fixing of calculus is called mathematical analysis, real analysis and complex analysis, which relies heavily on precise definitions, theorems, and proofs. We don't have time for it, but the mid-1800s, people really got going on confirming the foundations of calculus, and it was all motivated by, by Fourier. Also, it turns out when t is zero, you do get a, a, an actual Fourier series. This is not a Fourier series, right? Because of the exponential decays. But when t is zero, e to the zero is one, those go away. This is a Fourier series. It does equal f of x, our upside down parabola, for all x between zero and l. Okay? So it satisfies the boundary condition, the initial condition at zero, and the boundary conditions at zero and l. And you can prove that everything works out nicely in this example, but uh, that's a lot of work to be done. Let me end by looking at Mathematica and just seeing how this heat distribution changes over time. I picked L to be 5 here, and we're seeing how heat is being distributed over time. It's, it's getting cooler and cooler. You might wonder, how can this happen? Because shouldn't, as the heat flows, shouldn't these parts at 0 and 5 heat up? Remember, they're touching something that keeps them constant temperature of zero. Evidently, for this to really be valid in real life, evidently the bar must not really be insulated in the main part of it, except at the endpoints, so that heat can flow away. I'm not exactly sure of the physics of that. That must be what happens. But it certainly is a solution of the heat equation. And that's all I have for you, I think. Um, well, yeah. Well, oh, oh, I want to show you one more thing. You can make a 3D plot of it as well. It's a function of two variables. In this plot, uh, t goes to the right and x goes into the screen. You can make a 3D plot and rotate it if you like to see it as a function of two variables. That's the end. Thanks for watching.